Ash Ola. Hi guys, welcome to the symposium. Today we're lucky enough to start a as yet unnamed music podcast series. Um, and I'm happy to be joined by three of my music musical friends. Um, we've got Cameron, Jay and Arjun. So if you'd like to take turns just t- t- telling the listeners about what kind of stuff you listen to, what you want to listen to, or kind of just the stuff you've been listening to recently. Cameron? Uh, hi, yeah, so I'm Cameron. And uh, I guess if I had to narrow down the main areas of music that I listen to, it's probably sort of late 60s Baroque pop, uh, early 80s, late 70s new wave synth pop, and then a little bit of dream pop, chill wave, vapor wave, anywhere from sort of late 80s onwards. Right. Arjun? Um, yeah, I'm quite narrow in what I listen to. I mainly listen to just rap and hip hop. Um, but obviously, there's, there's lots of sub genres of rap. So if I'd have to talk about my preference, I'd talk about more 90s, sort of gritty street rap, New York rap. Um, so I'd like to sort of um, talk more about that um, in, in the future. And Jay? Uh, hi, I'm Jay. Um, I think my taste is, I'd probably say it's quite eclectic in the sense I'm kind of a jack of all trades, master of none. I kind of listen to a bit of everything. Um, I think a lot of my taste comes from hearing songs on a film soundtrack. So I think I like kind of songs that have got a bit of cinematic quality to them. But I'd say I'm fairly open minded. I'm ready to listen to kind of most songs and explore kind of different genres. Mm. Yeah, and I guess I'm pretty similar to all of you in that I, I'm similar to Jane that I kind of listen to a bit of everything, but I'm kind of similar to Arjun in that I, I guess I specialise per se, I guess in rap, um, especially um, kind of 90s New York rap. I'm trying to get into it more by listening to some of the Wu Tang Clan, but I listen a lot more to kind of more modern, maybe gangster rap or just stuff usually from the West Coast actually. So yeah, that's kind of generally my preference. Um, I guess the overall question is before we start kind of reviewing albums that we've given each other to listen for this episode is kind of what really attracts you to kind of different genres of music like I guess I just uh should direct the question to Arjun first because you listen to quite a narrow genre of music so what is it about rap that really attracts you um for me it's the beats um a lot of people listen to rap for lyrics and but I have got to admit when I listen to music I don't really pay attention to the lyrics first of all I, I more pay attention to, to the beats the production how it makes me feel and I feel like a lot of rap has a sort of grandiose um feel to it um, whether it's like a looping soul sample throughout the song or just the sort of qualities that each song evokes it makes me feel a certain way that's what attracts me to rap music first of all but then again you've got a lot of things um associated with rap so you have sort of voice of, of the rapper themselves their flow their tone and it just sort of um makes it interesting to me lots of lots of the different qualities that um carry through in a rap song okay um and is it kind of so so for you you then have like maybe the lyrics on the side would you read them as you listen to something or would you just try and just completely close your eyes and just kind of immerse yourself yeah, I guess this plays into the sort of question like how do how do we listen to music? How do we consume our music? Mm. Um, a lot of the time, I listen to an album the full way through without without looking at the lyrics, without reading anything about it. So whether I'm going for a run, going for a walk, um, cleaning my room, I just put it on in the background, listen to it the full way through. Um, and then the second time I listen to the same album, it's more about me deciding is this song worthy of being added to one of my playlists? Do I want to listen to the song in the future? should I add to my rotation and then after if I do like the song then I will listen to it properly look at the lyrics analyze it more in depth paying more attention to the lyrics to the production but um, most of the time um, if I'm discovering new music or just a new song in general I'll just listen to it um, whilst doing other things maybe potentially just closing my eyes listening to it enjoying the sort of feeling of listening to a new song I, I remember you saying to me that you like you, you spend time reading the lyrics on, on the internet whilst listening to it because yeah. it, you sort of analyse it like poetry. Um, I don't really do that. I pay attention to the lyrics um, sometimes, but more I'm just sort of doing other things and just seeing how the music makes me feel. Mm. I guess I think for me, I, I, the reason why I like to do that, uh, especially for kind of rap, is because um, I think often, especially the kind of rap I try to listen to, which is, I guess, what you would call kind of conscious rap, 
yeah. I do think a lot of the time people have something worthy that, that they're trying to say or something at least interesting or nearly all the time provocative that they're trying to say. So it's it I, I like engaging with that. And then the production and the things that kind of come in the background that you seem to prioritize, I think, carries the message as a kind of supplement rather than it being the message itself. I think that's our difference. Well, I mean, Definitely. Ca- yeah. I mean, Cameron, so you listen to like a very different. So your preferences for kind of very different genre to Arjun in that kind of new wave synth pop or or kind of hmm. the, that kind of stuff. I mean, yeah, what really yeah. attracts you to that? Because it's much less about the kind of gritty messaging that you <laughs> might get in conscious rap. I guess you could say so yeah I think one thing I love about music for me is that especially popular music I think it can really reflect the zeitgeist of the time yeah and exactly I've I've always been kind of a history nerd so I think it lets you look and get a little bit of an insight into what the culture of the time was like you know you can see mm-hmm. well was the prevailing mood at the time optimistic was there sort of uh, an austere vibe to it mm. you can really look just through I mean both instrumentation and lyrics, especially as you move more into like popular music and not so much hip hop, uh, yeah, you can really see the sort of social attitudes at the time reflected mm. in music. And then, so so then, how, how does that kind of translate to your specific taste? Because you like a lot of that, a lot of the late '60s, early '80s stuff. So, do you like a lot of the counterculture, counterculture, the late '70s, early '80s, especially you know, against the Thatcher? prime ministership and no as, and, and then and then i guess yeah, the 1960s no, de- uh, reflects the kind of cultural revolutions of the 60s as well you know definitely definitely i mean you look at pop music in the 1960s i mean you just had beatlemania you were moving away from 12 bar blues as mm. you progress through the 60s and you get bands and artists starting to think mm, well, what if i put in uh, a hammond organ or a harpsichord here mm. and you really yeah. start to push the boundaries of you know sonically of what pop music can achieve and you can see that right the way up through the late 70s and early 80s as well i mean i think that a lot of the music from that time still sounds futuristic mm. because you got to realize that when it came to craft work and tangerine dream that was only like the mid 1970s they really start to mm. gain that mainstream popularity it pushed the boundaries of what was capable in pop music I think that's what really attracts me to it. Same goes for dream pop as well. Uh, you look at the things that they do with the guitar. I'm thinking Kevin Shields and My Bloody Valentine. Mm-hmm. Those sort of act, those sort of acts. It just challenges the norms of what you would expect from a certain genre of music. Mm, that's that's really interesting. Um, Jay, would you like to add because your test is your taste, sorry, is is far more kind of eclectic. It's perhaps less focused. Um than Arjun or Cameron so I guess it's more kind of a general point to you about what really attracts you about kind of music and what does it mean to you yeah I actually think I'm kind of somewhere in the middle um I think I don't it's weird because I both would say that I don't necessarily pay that much much attention to lyrics but then for example all four of these albums I listened to I had genius lyrics open uh actually like reading the lyrics as I listened to the songs Mm. um so I think I kind of like to not necessarily fully analyse a song, but I like to kind of know roughly what it's about or what the idea is and what kind mm. of the prevailing mood of the lyrics is. Mm. But I think in kind of a similar vein to Cameron, I like, I said I kind of like the cinematic quality of music. So I like kind mm. of almost when you listen to, a, kind of I like, it, you know when you're out and about and you're kind of walking and a song comes on and you kind of feel like you're in a, you're in a film. Yes. Um, and it kind of just... I love that kind of weird feeling that music can kind of give and really in, enhance kind of, you know, the feelings of a given day or something through us, through the use of music. Um, and I think something also that I really do look for now, especially when listening to music, is the, is kind of something similar to what Cameron was saying, is like the use of kind of different instruments in a song that you wouldn't necessarily expect to be there. Mm. I mean, so do you also kind of get, because for me, I, I think I agree with Cameron to the extent that because of the kind of music I listen to, which, as I said, usually has someone trying to say something meaningful rather than perhaps um, just beats or kind of just general kind of pop discourse. Often I, I enjoy for the same reason Cameron does and that it says something interesting about the times we're living in. And, and it's often I enjoy listening to social commentary through music. So um and that, not, not even social commentary, but even individual commentary. So I like that kind of dichotomy of someone who can 
an artist that could talk about social issues external to them, but also then talk very, very, very beautifully and meaningfully about their own personal issues. I think you'd all kind of agree with that. And I, I think this is kind of a good place to jump to the albums that we all recommended that each other listen to. So I recommended that everyone listen to Merryweather Post Pavilion by Animal Collective, which I originally listened to because of Cameron's recommendation. Um, <laughs> um, just because I said to him, you know, um, no, he, he gave me some recommendations of good stuff to listen to because I made a massive indie playlist, indie music playlist of kind of especially British music from the 90s, 2000s, Britpop eras. Um and he, I asked him to add some songs to that, and he added a few from Animal Collective, and I, and then through that I kind of found them, and and I thought I really really enjoyed this album, and I, and I found it to be a quality experience, so I recommended it for you guys to listen to. Um, Jay recommended Illinois by Sufjan Stevens. Um, Jay, would you like to just give a brief overview of that? Yeah, so uh, Sufjan Stevens, I first discovered him watching Call Me by Your Name. Um, I absolutely hated the film, but there were two mm. scenes I thought were really good and both have original songs by him in it. Right. Um, and this was actually the final album of like of his major albums. This is actually the final one I listened to because, as you probably saw, it's it's quite a long album. Mm. Uh, it's got some very unconventional song names, which I think is a bit off-putting when you first look at it. But I think this kind of is the album for me where it's it kind of combines a lot of things I like. I think it's got this nice cinematic quality. And I think at the same time, it's a very ambitious project. It's trying to kind of do a lot of things and there's a lot going on. Mm. So I think it kind of has different songs to kind of different moods for me. I mean, um, yeah, that's, I mean, that's very interesting because it's, you, as you said, you, you acquired that music from a film, which I guess links to kind of what you said. Um, and then Cameron, yours is Penthouse and Pavement by Heaven 17. Uh, yeah, so this is, I think, one of those albums that I think is critically and commercially overlooked. A lot of people now, they only know Heaven 17. Uh, <laughs> their track Temptation is in uh, oh, the uh, Danny Boyle for Trainspotting. That's the one. Yes. It's, <laughs> it's in the nightclub scene in, uh, in Trainspotting. But no. Yes, uh, OK. Yes. <laughs> Penthouse and Pavement, uh, it was made by a trio. Uh, Heaven 17 originally, um, Martin Weir and Ian Craig Marsh from the Human League, uh, their original lineup. They left uh, when they had a lot of creative differences with Philip Oakey, uh, Philip Oakey, the lead singer, and they brought in Glenn, Gr Glenn Gregory on vocals. Mm. And what kind of resulted from that is a political statement in album form. It's sort of coming out against the increasingly materialist economic consensus of the 1980s. Mm -hmm. Well, she's using a lot of uh, rhythms and melodies borrowed from American funk music, tempered with uh, German influence, early Liverpool scene, orchestral maneuvers in the dark type synth pop. Mm -hmm. And it's a really unique record, I think, for that reason, but also just a really fun listen to. Mm. I mean, and then Arjun, you recommended Medellin to Don Fabio. Yeah, so this is not a conventional mainstream hip hop album by any means. Um, Smooth is sort of a, a rapper who embodies a sort of new wave of crime rap, but he's not very well known at all. If you look at his Spotify, he has barely 10,000 monthly listeners. Um, these are the sort of rappers and artists who have to rely on um, selling their own records on websites such as Bandcamp, um, making, selling their own vinyl records, making T-shirts. So it sort of embody, embodies the modern type of rap hustlers that um, were so famous in the 90s. Um, I really, I, I basically discovered this record by um, hearing um, Smooth sort of um, do features on other albums. Um, so I, I, I didn't really hear about him, but I just heard him on other albums and decided I'll check him out. Um, and the collaboration with this producer, Giallo Point, he's a British hip hop producer. I thought it was really interesting the sort of coming together between um, British hip hop and American sort of uh, New York rap. Um, but yeah, I thought it was a really interesting. Listen, I'd be interested to hear what you guys think about it. Yeah, I mean, uh, before we kind of jump into then talking about those individual albums, I wondered whether we could kind of come back to the overall points about um, kind of what we really get from music. Because Cameron, for example, I know that you are also, although you're those like dream pop and synth pop are kind of your favorite genres, you also do really enjoy a good hip hop album and you, you're quite, quite wide in your taste as well. So 
Oh, what yeah. is it about what is it about those kind of albums that attract you considering that they're very different to perhaps your favorites um i think with those albums particularly it is really more i mean it is always a cop out just to say oh it's subjective but end the podcast, it, 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 the podcast there, yeah. we, we've officially answered music but uh <laughs> yeah no um i think with those Again, it's it's like the modern culmination of everything I talked about, like I said, with uh, New Wave and Baroque pop. It takes your sort of core elements of what a good pop music record should do. It should appeal to a wide variety of people with common themes, but it distills that into something that remains sonically uh, experimental. You have these structures and time signatures which aren't common. The are they come from a soundscape which you might not really have listened to before i mean i know we'll go into in more detail but like for example with the animal collective record um a lot of that is dream pop and shoegazy in the sense that you just have this full spectral like wall of sound yes of electronic instrumentation and it's like you can have that whilst talking about something as uh, mundane as looking at a stoplight and it's just that sort of clash of common themes and musical invention that really mm. attracts me to it. Mm. And then Arjun, I mean, so you're you're kind of listened, as you said, very narrowly so far. So what is it what is it about kind of what you hope to gain from other areas of music that is really encouraging you to listen more broadly? Um, I think it's just sort of the accomplishment of oh. Um, I've heard this record by this this um, artist. Oh, okay, like, right. It's just more the sort of wanting to cover them, you know. So I've been trying to get into, say, Jimi Hendrix recently, trying to get into Prince. Brilliant, mostly, both of them. Mo- mostly just because, um, you know, I've always heard so much about them. My dad may have listened to them. My dad may have preached their music towards me, and I've just sort of brushed it off in the past. But now I'm getting into that stage where I'm, as I'm getting more mature and getting sort of older, I'm realizing that I shouldn't be so narrow and, and limited in what I listen to. Um, so I'm trying to trying to really um, expand my soundscape and ex- expand my horizons um, and listen to these sort of famous and well-respected artists that I think it's sort of necessary and important to listen to. Mm. And then I guess we should then jump into the kind of albums you recommended. So I guess Arjun, considering you just kind of finished that, I, I think you should start. Um, so... What are your initial thoughts on the album you recommended to us? Why did you recommend this album? And kind of what stands out about it to you beyond, you know, Smooth being perhaps an example of um, at least contextually a a hustling rapper? Right. Yeah. So I listened to this album, I'd say, I think probably just before the start of lockdown. So a couple of months ago, Mm -hmm. Um, it wasn't the first album of Smooth or Giallo Point that I listened to. As you probably can infer from the title, it's a sequel to the original Medellin Don Fabio album. But I recommended this one because I thought it was an interesting sort of um, starting off point for this type of rap. Um, I guess what really attracted me to it, to it was the sort of dark atmospheric beats. Um, that sort of reminded me of beats by hip hop producers The Alchemist or Havoc from Mob, Mob Deep. Yeah. Um, and I thought I thought um, the production was very cinematic and very sort of grandiose. And that's what really attracted me to it. Um, I love listening to sort of soulful looping samples in, in hip hop. And I thought... I thought this this works really well. Um, in terms of um, Smooth himself, he may not be he may not be a very appealing rapper in terms of his voice, um, and his lyrics aren't exactly top tier. But I think I think he he, he sort of complements the beats very well. Um, and yeah, they, they, he was basically complemented by production very well. Um, a criticism I would have of the album is that most of the songs are very sort of samey samey. They don't they're, they're not very distinct um in terms of um what they offer but if you're a fan of sort of new york queensbridge rap from the 90s or early 2000s i think you'd like this album mm. well i mean yeah I'm, I'm trying to as you know i'm trying as you know i'm intending to listen with you some kind of of the wu-tang albums and yeah. trying to expand my taste from more modern stuff into the 90s stuff on which the modern stuff is built on i guess um i mean i start directed to you jay so based on what Arjun said about his kind of views on the album, considering this was what I assume your first listen, what were your impressions? So I've actually got to say, I pretty much agree with most of what you said, which is I particularly liked the first kind of few tracks because I thought there was this real, really good cinematic quality. 
And I especially liked when you had what sounded kind of like newsreels. I don't know if they were if they're actual newsreels or they're just recorded for the album. But I thought that gave it kind of a really nice um like this cinematic quality. Um I do agree with Arden. One of the things I kind of thought was a drawback of the album was that it kind of felt like it was going for a concept album vibe. But I'm yeah. not really sure I got what necessarily what the concept was outside of you know, outside of the um spoken parts of it mm. um i do also for me i think this is one of my issues probably more with rap more generally is i do often find it gets a bit samey um i think i preferred the tracks where there were a couple of um features on on it because at least you know the kind of the vo- the verses stopped sounding kind of all sounding the same mm. Um, I thought the production was really nice. I liked especially when they had the the more kind of Spanish vibes going on. That was kind of more at the start and towards the end. Yeah. Um, one thing is I kind of felt like this was maybe an album I'd enjoy more if I had it on in the background rather than just sitting in a room and listening to it. So, Jay, that's a very interesting yeah, point. Yeah. You, Jay, that's a very interesting point you touched on there, just about rap more generally. So do you find it easier to listen when the lyrics are accompanied by a melody rather than perhaps the melody solely being the production and the instrumentals with the lyrics being spoken? No, not necessarily. I think for me, it's more when the, there's kind of one bass that doesn't really change much throughout the entire song right. or the melody okay. doesn't change. Like I mm. kind of could have done with maybe a chorus or, you know, something else going on as the song went on. Just I found that maybe I'd kind of my ears would kind of after a minute or two would start to get a bit bored. <laughs> Oh, fair enough. I mean, Cameron? Uh, yeah, well, I do kind of agree on that. I think in a lot of ways, the, the first thing that struck me about this project was the production of it. I did have to stop and think, was this like not made in 1995? <laughs> yeah. And that is, I think, as much a compliment as it is also a criticism, because <laughs> it does give off a very unique uh, throwback East Coast vibe, which I, yeah. I can appreciate. But I do also get what Jay's saying. It can feel at times more like um, a reel of demo tapes or an extended mixtape EP type thing as opposed to a fully fledged concept album. I mean, based on Arjun's characterization of the rapper and perhaps what he's trying to say in terms of the bootlegging nature of the cartel, do you think that choice is, is um, intentional by the artist? Uh, I do, yeah, I do. I think, especially when you listen to the simple loops, the soul samples, the Latin record sample, they definitely were trying to evoke uh, a certain image. And I think they do that, by and large, pretty successfully. It's just, like Jay said, whether or not it's something with a lot of replay value or something with sort of broad appeal beyond that narrow audience, that jury's still out on that one. But I can appreciate it for what it is. (laughs) Yeah, Yeah. I've got to say, actually, I've listened to... Is it Unexpected Come Up? I've listened to that quite a few times. Um, I just really, really liked the sampling going on in that song. I think that's the third track Mm. on the album. I I was going to say that I... I kind of agree with what you all said about the kind of 90s-esque production. It reminds me kind of of gangster rap in the 90s, the kind of stuff that you see put over cartoons on Instagram. (laughs) And and I I do personally really like that sound, hence I'm trying to get more into it, that kind of more traditional MF Doom style gangster rap. Um, But um, I do get what Cameron said in that that can be perceived as a criticism in terms of it perhaps is lacking in some t- sometimes in, in in terms of quality. Um, I, I, I also, for some reason, I'm not sure if any of you agree, I got some kind of vibes of because of the substantial use of actual physical orchestral instruments. I got some vibes of late 90s, early 2000s rap, which was which were kind of in between two sustained periods of, of uses of synths. And I found that. I actually noticed the use of physical instruments quite strongly, especially when considering this came out in 2018, or all the rap that's made now is based on electronic and synthy sounds. Like even Madlib um, in the album Bandana with Freddie Gibbs used an iPad to produce what is for him extraordinarily electric sounds. And this that kind of that kind of did surprise me, but I, I enjoyed it because I do like. Um, I do like the kind of use of physical instruments. I mean, yeah, Arjun, would you like to come in? Yeah, um, I think going back to what Cameron said about the music being quite samey, samey, I do agree. Um, all these rappers that um, are featured on the album, so you've got rappers like Husking, Ping, Rome Streets, SD Nack, 
Rock Marciano, and then other other artists that I love listening to, such as um, The God for Him, um, West Side Gun, Eto, Flea Lord. Um, these these um, rappers all sort of release albums pretty much every week. Um, in terms of, you've always got at least two to three of them releasing an album every week. So, and, and I'm always straight to it. I'm like, brilliant. Um, I'd love to listen to this. I download it. I listen to it. But it does get a bit samey, samey in terms of you listen to so much output from them um, that everything's getting repeated. And there's not much um, difference in subject matter, what they're talking about. Hence, I just listen to it mainly for the production mm. um, and the beats rather than necessarily what the rappers are um, are addressing in terms of the subject matter. There's just so much there that yeah. I don't I don't really mind if half the album isn't good because I know that there's another there, there will definitely be a few tracks in there that I can I like and add to my playlist. Mm. And then that goes into the sort of um, thing, um, the question of is an album good if four songs from a, an album, say 20 tracks, are excellent and you listen to them regularly, but the rest is, uh, is guff and very average? Or do you do you, do you rate an album because on the whole it's an enjoyable listen? Um, Without any outstanding tracks. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I mean, what do you boys think about that then, Jay Cameron? Uh, well, I think that actually has a lot to do with how we digest music in the modern era. It's not like we have to go out and physically buy a record or buy a CD to listen to some songs off an album we like. We can just add them into a playlist. So we might not think of an album being as good now if, say, only... I don't know, four out of 20 songs on it are ones that we would consistently come back and listen to. Whereas, I don't know, in the past, I think you might have had albums like that with only a quarter of the songs being consistently good and you would return to. So I think that goes to a lot of how music is dispensed now. Mm. Jay? I think I somewhat want when I listen to an album for it to kind of work as a cohesive piece. Yes, um, I agree with you. I think I'm quite old school in that perspective as well. Yeah, I think mm. even if even if to some extent there are, you know, 10 great songs, but all of the songs don't necessarily, don't seem like they belong on the same record. I don't know if I'd necessarily go so far to say that this is a great album. I'd say it's kind of a great, you know, collection of songs. Mm. I know, I think that's very interesting um, because, well... I mean, in terms of the di- dichotomy that Arjun offered, I'd say I p- I'd prefer an album that had a load of, of like seven to eight out of ten songs that fitted cohesively rather than having some threes out of ten, some ten out of tens, and yeah. perhaps then mm. perhaps then being kind of Im- imbalanced. I mean, one thing I did notice about the album was his lack of, as, as, as all of you have actually said, his lack of variety in his actual voice. Although rap is spoken verse, you can have, I mean, people like Kendrick Lamar, for example, um, who, you, who you all know I'm a massive fan of. He, he's very good at, at changing his voice, at using the kind of spoken word in its most versatile form and maybe changing tone, changing pitch, um, changing changing flow and speed. And I think that this album kind of lacked that variety. Yeah. Where, you know, where, as you all said, it did get quite samey eventually. Sorry, I think it was kind of saved whenever there were songs with multiple different features on it, because at least you'd have kind of, it would sound different and it wasn't this like one kind of one note track. Yeah, I did find well, it I curious mean... as well, sorry, on, on, on the album. I actually quite liked a lot of the lyrics and what was mm. being said. It was just mm. the delivery of the lyrics I thought could get mm. quite repetitive. Yeah. I, mean, I did think that the concept was well executed. You know, you've got consistent comparisons to uh, the drug cartel and life in the streets or whatever i did like those consistent comparisons i thought the metaphors were broadly sound i just thought that it wasn't always appealing to as a listener mm. um, no I, I, just, I think i agree with that yeah um if i were to tell you that the se- the sorry the, the prequel to this album medellin um which was released in 2017 um the year before this one if i told you that album pretty much had a feature on every track um, and was better than this album, would you be inclined to give it a listen? Definitely, yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Okay, I'll, I'll view that as a success then. <laughs> <laughs> no, because I think, as we've all said, that because of the kind of smooth, kind of, not to say monotonous is, I guess, a harsh word to use, but I guess his, his quite consistent 
and generic delivery i think features as jay has said specifically would benefit it in just in just holding the listener's interest because they hear something different because because smooth doesn't seem to want to or doesn't doesn't seem to um want to um change his flow change his pitch and, and do things that he could otherwise do that would that would even allow different verses to say different things you know like like the pitch and the flow of a, of a rap verse actually mean something in themselves they're not just forms of delivery to keep the listeners interest i think right yeah definitely right so i think we should move on then i think jay do you want to go next yeah sure so um my album was as we've already said illinois by sophion stevens so just to kind of give a quick background so in this was released in 2005 um, it was originally part of what he called the 50 states project where he said he was going to make one one album for every state but wow that's a lot actually, of albums there's only actually <laughs> been two of them and then ever since illinois his sound has changed in kind of every subsequent album um but i mean i think this is a i personally think this is a fantastic album i think it's kind of got a good mix of being very personal um, mm-hmm. And obviously there's there's some ballads in here, which there's, you know, there's a lot of emotion and there's a lot of heart. But then there's also like weird things that are kind of just trying to evoke this image of, you know, the state of Illinois in all these different places, some of which I've heard of, some of which I haven't. Mm-hmm. And then there's like weird musical interludes. Um, also, one thing I do like about this album, I just want to kind of say this, is there's one thing you probably notice is there's a lot of different instruments. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. The overwhelming majority of them were played by Sufjan himself, which I just thought that's was very nice. impressive. Yeah, that's very, very impressive. Ball field. <laughs> um, yeah, so so Cameron. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think I can forgive the four percent completion rate on his uh, American State project. For, for for me, this is the perfect American folk record of our time. I I really can't find a lot of flaws in this album. Uh, the instrumentation is lush, uh, vast, expansive. Uh, the quality of the lyrics is uh, second to none. I think you really touch on a lot of issues here, and I think he, you know, delivers these themes and concepts uh, with great success. Uh, mm. It's a cohesive album about the identity of a state and mm. all the little. Uh, curious incidents and uh, historical events that come with that I really can't find a lot of bad things to say about this album it's a 10 out of 10 for me I mean I think I massively agree so just kind of offer my my two cents I think I really like the kind of precise instrumentals and how they match with the kind of dichotomy of views that he presents so he presents beautifully kind of the individual lives of people in Illinois in songs like John Wayne, John Wayne Gacy Jr. Mm. And then he can go to like kind of more broader themes that reflect on not only the state's perception of itself, but perhaps maybe more East Coast perceptions of the Midwest. And he's very yeah. good at kind of and very yeah. adept at displaying those as well. And I think that that's, you know, um, superimposed on a beautifully precise and melodic instrumental almost classically instrumental score um and um i think that 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 really benefits the album because it kind of adds a coherence and almost moral weight to his discourse it's not something that's treated as fleeting or morally bankrupt with kind of perception of electric sounds that are that are you know kind of disorientating it's melodic which almost makes the messages and the lyrics stick longer with you Mm. um I mean, I think Arjun, would, do you, you have more to add? I sort of went into this album expecting to hate it because as, as you've inferred from now, this is not the sort of music I like. However, I was pleasantly surprised by it. I, I, I found it quite an enjoyable listen and I'm grateful that I did hear it. Um, I, did think, I did think the sort of his voice sort of irritated me to an extent because mm. he, sort of sang, he sort of sings in a sort of barely above a whisper voice that can be a bit irritating at times. Um, the composition compositions are sort of quite short instrumental phrases arranged in like repeating patterns, and I don't know. I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't. I don't think the music it by itself was particularly um, memorable and catchy. Mm. However, in terms of an album, I thought it flowed well, and it was a, a decent listen. But it's not one that I'd come back to again and again. Mm. Um, thinking, oh, I'd love to play this album again or to, you know, I can't really recall a song from the album. 
if you get what I mean. But I did enjoy the, the album. I'd give it sort of five out of ten. Now, I, I, I understand that to you guys, that might seem a bit hard. <laughs> but you've got, to understand, you've got to understand that I'm approaching this from a completely sort of ignorant viewpoint here. And I, I think it has potential to be a grower if I were to listen to it again and again. Mm. No, I mean, I think I... The, the kind of reason why I really like it is because, I, as Cameron said, I mean, I'm a massive history nerd as well, and I really liked the kind of juxtaposition of his personal views with kind of more broader discourse, which I guess I really, which I guess is the reason why I like conscious rap as well. Stuff like the Black Hawk War, um, I think that was a really, really, I think that was quite impressive in terms of the discourse there. I think it was about Native Americans. Yeah. Um, and I really enjoyed that kind of discourse just because it played both on long-standing stereotypes and obviously deep-rooted historical pain but then also more individual aspects which I think as I said earlier on are kind of the two things that I'm looking for in, in music I mean Jay Cameron would you like to maybe rebut or, or maybe uh, give some context to some of what Arjun said well I mean just another track that I can think of uh, in the similar vein that you were saying Ash is uh, the track Jacksonville I mean he, yeah. I think he paints a very beautiful picture of a town who doesn't really know if it's named after uh, Andrew Jackson, the quite a prolific racist. So <laughs> he, he, he engages with those heavy concepts. He does that quite consistently throughout. I mean, Casimir Pulaski Day, uh, you've got him trying to mediate his strong Christian convictions with the brutal unfairness of um, cancer. Uh, in a young teenager uh, as we've already mentioned John Wayne Gacy Jr it, it takes exceptional skill in my eyes as a songwriter uh, as, as a musician and a lyricist to compose a ballad which not only recounts in excruciating detail the horrific crimes of a serial killer but actually tries to make you feel sympathetic for him yeah, it, it, it's those it's those that that sort of duality throughout about finding sympathy where you might not otherwise and being willing to engage with these really heavy, dark concepts. Mm. That is what continually actually drags me back to the album. I know, Arjun, you said it didn't have a lot of replay value for you. I think it might be one where it is a grower in that it does deal with some quite depressing concepts as a full-length piece and not as a collection of short songs so yeah, i think cameron i think that's specifically shown in maybe casimir Pula um, pulaski day Definitely. which is yeah. kind of which is kind of built on a very personal story that is um kind of exacerbated or increased in its in its power by the use of the specific instruments that sofian uses so oh, i think yeah. i think there um he kind of uses weak string instruments or just kind of basic ban like a banjo um which kind of conveyed to me um the vulnerability of the story and the kind of exposure that it has to external forces he doesn't use the massive huge trumpets that he uses to make the massive statements about america and like the black hawk war which is kind of mm. strong statements about the founding principles of america and and historical injustice this is much more vulnerable, perhaps showing the vulnerability of individual painful stories compared to the kind of collective strength you get from a long standing historical myth. Mm. Um, and yeah. Jay, Jay, I think you have more to add. Yeah, I think one song that I really actually want to point out on this album is the, the Night Zombies song with the mm. cheerleading. Because mm. I feel like it does, it's kind of a really good way of, it takes as Cameron kind of said, like this idea of it being kind of like the perfect American album, it takes cheerleading, this kind of stereotypical American sport, brings it into like the musical style of the song. Because um, you can kind of see all these influences. There's, you know, all these, all these kind of horns that run throughout the entire album. It's kind of like almost like a motif. Um, and one thing I also think really interesting is the Sears Tower song. So obviously mm. Sears Towers, um, I think it's the, it's now called the Willis Tower. It's the tallest building in Chicago. Mm. But here it seems to be about something. There's a lot of religious imagery in this song. Um, it's kind of got this creepiness to it. Um, I think that there's a lot of, as Cameron kind of mentioned, this idea of like this Christian conflict. There's, you know, there's other ideas about kind of personal stories. There's also in the Predatory Wasp, it's kind of 
seems to be quite obvious that he's fallen in love with his best friend. And I think that song in particular stands out for combining kind of the acousticness of, you know, a lot of the ballads with kind of the more in your face, jolly um, orchestral kind of scores to it. Mm. Um, do you kind of have more to add? That, uh, I mean, I guess Arjun, hearing that, what we've spoken about there, the use of instrumentals to convey or to um, add to the messaging in the lyrics, do you, does that kind of add a different perspective for you? Yeah, certainly. Like, as I said, I hadn't really read anything about the album or read any reviews beforehand. If I'd known, <laughs> if I'd sort of done that, I would have perhaps approached it in a different light. And hearing what you guys had to say about it, I think I am tempted to sort of go back and listen to some of the tracks again um, with that sort of fresh perspective. But I mean, I, I, I do think the way you approached it is almost the best way in that it's a very honest perspective. You're going in with no no preconceived notions, no context, and you just go in and, and whatever the music speaks to you, it speaks to you. And I think that's honestly yeah. a very honest perspective that you shouldn't readily change. Yeah, I mean... Um, as we all know, music is subjective, right? So, <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I guess I guess I'll go next then. So, yeah, I mean, Meriwether Post Pavilion is an album by Animal Collective. It came out in 2009, I think, and um, I really enjoy it because it built on long-standing preferences I had for kind of synth pop, but also some kind of almost psychedelic elements because I'm a massive fan of psychedelic 70s rock as well massive fan of Pink Floyd especially their earlier work and I feel this kind of builds on those those foundations but with a modern twist through the messaging and the lyrics at hand especially specific songs like My Girls um, which I really enjoy because of the just orchestral grandiose musical sounds that make them kind of very easy to listen to but also very easy to repeatedly listen to Um, so I guess Cameron considering that you're the one that introduced me to this (laughs) Uh, to this band I mean uh, would you like to go first because I know you're a massive fan of the album as well uh, yeah I mean full disclosure this is probably my favorite album of the 21st century uh, if not all time um I just I, I guess a good place to start is that Panda Bear member of Animal Collective is quite often compared to Brian Wilson from the Beach Boys yeah um, not only yeah. in terms of uh, vocal delivery but also in terms of what he does with the studio uh his experimentation so on and so forth yeah the, so, the kind of alto delivery definitely definitely and you see that throughout i mean you just have these songs which start off with beautiful melodies intricate electronic loops and washes of sound and quite often you know they'll take you by surprise and just how they explode in this crescendo of noise mm. and i i really yeah it's it, it's a beautiful album um if i t- had to pick a, a standout track from it i would say one that i think is actually kind of underrated is daily routine yeah uh, it opens the switch up, with, the switch up. <laughs> it, it, it is a brilliant switch up it opens with just these synths mm. uh tw- sort of twinkling away on a random arpeggiator and you think i don't know where this is going and then again it, it explodes into sound and it's one album that i think no matter how many times you listen to it, or how many times I listen to it for once at least, it will always take you by surprise in what you will hear in the background and where it goes in mm. terms of song structure, lyrics, everything. It's a brilliant album. So Arjun, I guess I want to bring you in here because as I said, it has some kind of psychedelic elements. And although you're a massive rap fan, and that's most of what you listen to, I know that you're a bit of a Pink Floyd fan as well. So yeah. what, what did this album do for you? Yeah, I love Pink Floyd. I really like Tame Impala, King Gizzard and the Wizard as well. Um, to be honest, this is my favourite album, not just of the three, but of the four, even the one that I recommended. I prefer yeah. this album to um, to Medellin and to, um, I really enjoy this album. I thought it was quite a beautiful and haunting listen. Um, every track for me did something, made me feel something, mm. um, made me feel in sort of an exuberant, joyous, but also depressed state. So it made me feel it was both reflective and introspective as well. Um, and it's definitely made me want to check out the rest of their, their work. Mm. I mean, uh, which did any specific tracks jump out to you or any specific moments of instrumental or lyrics? Yeah, I really liked Lion in a Coma and mm. Daily Routine. Um, it, they were good. I liked Daily Routine, the sort of looping sample that was came throughout. Um, yeah, I would just I, I did enjoy this album. I can't really, I don't, I don't know. Because the thing with me is I find it hard talking about how music makes me feel. 
mm. and analyzing it in depth. So my contribution is just to say that I like the album, <laughs> and it, in itself, that's quite a good thing for me. Right. No, no, I, I understand completely because I guess I guess that also is a very honest perspective in that you just tw- it just elicits feelings in you and you let you let you let your kind of instinct and subconscious lead your interpretation, which I guess is is fair enough. I mean, Jay. Yeah. So one of the things I felt about this album was I kind of felt like if I had my, you know, my headphones in and I was walking around on a really summer's day, like a really summery day, I felt like that would I maybe would have appreciated it more. That's when I first I would, listened to it. Yeah, I'm not actually saying that. <laughs> yeah. Um, that's what I was, I was kind of thinking that's what it needs, but I thought it was fantastic. Um, yeah. One of the things I, so I agree with Arjun on Lion and Nakoma. Another song that stood up for me was also Frightened. They both, song, yeah. they both, in a weird way, kind of reminded me of like Revolver era slash Within Without You um from the Beatles Beatles. yeah yeah Yeah. Yeah, that was kind of the vibe I mean that's a huge compliment um for me as Cameron says like the music was like really really like tight everything it was there were constant changes and switch ups throughout the songs there was like this huge wall of sound it felt it kind of in a weird way it felt kind of poppy and very accessible but Mm. but also very kind of technically finessed um yeah it was a really good album Mm. I also really, really liked the final track. I thought it was a really good way of ending it. I thought there was this, um, I can't quite remember what, what exactly was set. There was like this, re- re- um, there were a lot of like repeated lines and I found it kind of very, almost intense to listen to it. I mean, uh, Cameron, you, you're the one who's kind of uh, most familiar with their wider work. So uh, mm. what other albums do you think that they have ha- ha- that they have that, that kind of reflects this or how do they differ in their other work? And also, what is it about this artist that really drove this kind of quality, technical, almost 1970s style um, sound? Yeah, I mean, well, Animal Collective's other work. Uh, well, I mean, it's the famous joke. Free Animal Collective fans walk into a bar. They don't order a drink. <laughs> they argue about what their favourite album is. Um, <laughs> but uh, I would say that Strawberry Jam or Feels is probably, they, they're, they're probably the most similar um musically uh strawberry jam has this slightly more abrasive punky feel to it. it's much more mm. energetic uh they have a uh, deacon that comes in there uh there's only three actually out of the four members on meriwether post pavilion mm. uh same goes for feels as well but there they use the guitar in a slightly more introspective way as the name kind of suggests mm. uh and they're both fantastic albums as well but the thing with Meriwether that um, I think keeps me coming back to it because I, I, I listen to this album um, maybe like once every week still, and I've, <laughs> I've, 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 yeah, and I've known about it for like four or five years. Um, and I think what keeps it cup, keeps me coming back is the themes that they are so willing to discuss on it, and that I think are quite lacking in pop music currently on a broader level. And those are the themes of sort of support and optimism. Mm. You know, I know Arjun said that a lot of the tracks make him feel this sort of of depressed mindset. And I can understand that because it does, again, go into these long passages of just questioning, I would say, is the best way to describe it. But then, as Jay said, you have tracks like The Closer, Brother Sport, with these anthemic rallies behind mm. telling you it's going to be all right it's going to be all right and th- those are those are paired with some quite pretty standard i would say love songs as well you've got tracks like summertime clothes and bluish in the mix and they are quite standard or typical you could say in a way i guess but i think when you pair that with the lush soundscapes and i think as jay said as well the wall of sound this electronic dabbling that you get with samplers and synthesizers Mm. it really makes for a unique listen and one that's very enticing to come back to well thank you i mean and then i guess that then leads us nicely into your choice for this week uh yeah um so my choice for this week was uh penthouse and pavement by Mm -hmm. heaven 17 
And uh, I was thinking of uh, an album to recommend you that was synth pop because it does form quite a lot of what I listen to. Yeah. But with synth pop uh, and with a lot of the great bands of that time, quite often they're not really album bands, if you know what I mean. They're more singles bands. You'll know them from one big song that uh, yeah. you probably I heard your mum play on Absolute 80 or something. <laughs> <laughs> um, but no, th- th- I picked this because I think it's a really good album with a strong concept at the heart of it, and that mm. is dealing with the morality of excess at a time when that was starting to become the economic and actually the social norm. And I think it's quite a good response to that, and I think musically as well, it uses a lot of really sound ideas and brings them together in a way that uh makes for quite a cohesive listen mm. i guess uh arjun i'll start with you what did you think of it um yeah i i also enjoyed this album um i i really liked play to win um mm. from memory yeah. that, that was a really good song i like the um repeated like play to win um sample that kept coming in mm. um would you call it a sample i'm not sure um mm. but yeah know. yeah um it was a good good album i thought i thought it reflected the sort of um get um pessimism at the time of 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 the british government um mm. so i thought anyway i thought the lyrics were quite political and anti-establishment in their nature um mm. i don't know what cameron has to say in terms of giving us a bit of background about it <laughs> um well yeah i think it is inherently a political record i mean the the, the first track is called <laughs> you don't need this fascist groove thing <laughs> so um whatever your views on that may be but um no it is a political record but like i was saying at the start sort of why i like music i think it reflects the zeitgeist at the time insofar as even some of the you might say non-political tracks on it or more abstract tracks on it i mean my favorite on this record is uh geisha boys and temple girls yes 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 uh because it, even something as that it has this sort of sonic austerity in it mm. where you can't really decipher what's going on at first so you give it a few more listens and you think wow that, that's, that's actually quite a lot going on there you just need to sort of look beyond uh the veil so to speak so is austerity is obviously a very politically motiv- politically charged word so is that used intentionally by you to demonstrate what they're trying to say uh <laughs> maybe subconsciously yeah i would think so but uh <laughs> Uh, also in the more literary sense of um it can be quite a barren album at times this i feel mm. there are uh, like for example the opening of geisha boys and temple girls or uh, the closer um we are going to live for a very long time uh the last minute or so of that is just a constant loop of the uh phrase over and over again which curious enough actually um i have this album on vinyl and the original pressing they actually looped that final section into the runoff groove. So mm. uh, if you look on Wikipedia, it's one of the only albums with uh, technically an infinite runtime. So um, I, I think there you can see what they were going for in this sort of sound devoid of emotion on first listen. But then you give it more and more listens and you think, OK, there is actually quite a lot of expressive statement in this. Mm. Jay? Yeah, I've so I one thing is when I first saw this, I kind of when I saw the name of the first song, I kind of rolled my eyes. I was like, oh no, it's just <laughs> kind of some some half ass <laughs> political political album. Um I've gotta say, if you've actually paid attention to my Spotify, you've probably just seen me listen to nothing but that Geisha Boys song over and over and over again. Mm. Um I've listened to it probably about twenty times. Um mm. I thought it was the best song on the album. I really enjoyed listening to this. I thought it was like the whole album. I thought it was really good fun. Um I thought it was if we're talking about like kind of the political message, I really liked the Let's All Make a Bomb song because I just mm. thought it was it was good satire. Mm. It was funny. It was there was kind of this almost like a sci-fi vibe to the sound mm. of the album. Mm. um mm. and you know the simps here were like so heavy and so in your face and... almost like the kind of like rumble and churn of like the distorted electrics in in like songs like we're going to live for a very long time yeah i think that that, that kind of echoed geisha boys and temple girls to me mm. yeah, yeah i i thought it was a fantastic album um i liked it also so there were some verses that just kind of went on and on and on and i thought they were really good when they kind of just got into the flow of a verse 
Mm. Um, and I found that, as we were kind of saying, like I found, I said that I don't really like it when a song is when a you know a song is one note, and this wasn't happening here at all. You know, there were constant kind of switch ups, and there were constant introductions of new instruments, and mm. you know, there was a lot going on. I mean, from my perspective, even not not even musically, but I knew of this album because it was quite famous just in the context of the time. Like Mike Reed had banned you know, the tracks on Radio One. Um, <laughs> and, you know, it was actually quite famous just in the context of the culture of the 1980s. So I, I was familiar with this album before I'd actually heard the music. And honestly, the music kind of lived up to the context almost, where yeah. to the extent that the quality of the music actually felt like it was an album that was worth talking about. It wasn't a mediocre album that people, you know, got bothered about for no reason or just to jump on a bandwagon. It was genuinely music that was provocative enough mm. that that deserved a reaction from whomever it elicited, elicited one from. Mm, and yeah. I think that, that that is a massive compliment because that means that it, it obviously received a huge reaction. But the fact that that reaction was justified for good or for bad, I think, is a massive compliment on the album. Mm. Um and I think, yeah, that's a really, really good choice, not even just from a music perspective there, Cameron, but I guess to kind of link what we said at the start about what music means to us, whether it sees as the zeitgeist, whether it's social commentary, mm. whether it's commentary about the individual, all of that is brought to the fore really beautifully in this album. And I think for that reason, it was a brilliant choice. Yeah. Um, but overall, boys, I'd like to thank you. I think that was really enjoyable. I hope you three had a really good time as well. As well. I mean, I really enjoyed myself, you know, listening to these new albums and talking about them um and yeah i hope that you enjoyed it too and uh, we'll see you next time on the symposium music series cheers the symposium with ash orlap